12 million pounds of confetti dropped into New York City's so-called Canyon of Heroes. Americans were officially welcoming the troops home from the Persian Gulf War. So it worked out really great for us. I mean, uh, it just goes to show that we're a mighty nation and uh, we'll be there for no matter what comes along. I mean, it's the strongest country in the world and you got to be glad to live here. So tell me what you feel about uh, media coverage of the war. I guess it was good. It got to be a mu bit much after a while, but uh, I guess it was good to know everything, you know. I guess in Vietnam you didn't really know a lot was going on, but here you pretty much up to the up to the moment on everything, so I guess it was good to be informed. For the first time because of technology, we have the ability to be live from many locations around the globe. And because of the format, an all-news network, we can spend whatever time is necessary uh, to bring the viewer the complete context of that day's portion of the story. And by context, I mean the institutional memory that is critical to understand why and how. And that's those who are analysts and do commentary uh, and those who can uh, explain. Slug that last piece, um, ITN, Israel post-war. Uh, going to war is a serious business. In a totalitarian society, the uh, dictator just says, we're going to war, and everybody marches. And with this weapon of human brotherhood in our hands, we are seeing the war for men's minds, not as a battle of truth against lies, but as a lasting alliance pledged in faith with all those millions driving forward to create the true new order, the world order of the people first, the people before all. In a democratic society, the theory is that if the political leadership has committed the war, they present reasons and they got a very heavy burden of proof to meet because the war is a very catastrophic affair, as this one proved to be. Uh, the role of the media at that point is to uh, allow, is to present the relevant background, for example, the possibilities of peaceful settlement, such as what they may be, have to be presented, and then to present uh, to offer a forum, in fact, encourage a forum of debate over this very dread decision to go to war and, in this case, kill hundreds of thousands of people and leave two countries wrecked and so on. Uh, that never happened. Uh, the, there was never, uh, well, you know, when I say never, I mean 99.9% .9 of the discussion uh, excluded the option of a peaceful settlement. That Washington's Office of War Information calls one of the most vital and constructive tasks of this war. This is a people's war, and to win it, the people ought to know as much about it as they can. This office will do its best to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, both at home and abroad. First weapon in this worldwide strategy of truth is the great machine of information represented by the free press, with its powers of molding public thought and leading public action, with all its lifelines for the exchange of new ideas between fighting nations spread across the earth. Every time George Bush would appear and say there will be no negotiations, there would be, you know, 100 editorials the next day lauding him for going the last mile for diplomacy. Uh, if he said, uh, you can't reward an aggressor, instead of cracking up in ridicule the way people did in the civilized sectors of the world, like the whole third world, uh, the media said, oh man, a fantastic principle, you know, the invader of Panama, the only head of state. Uh, stands condemned for aggression in the world. The uh, guy was head of the CIA during the Timor aggression, you know. He says aggressors can't be rewarded. The media just applauded. People don't want a war unless you have to have one. And they would have known that you don't have to have one. Well, the media kept people from knowing that. Uh, and that means we went to war very much in the manner of a totalitarian state, thanks to the media subservience. That's the big story. I'd like to ask you a question essentially about the methodology in studying the propaganda model and how would one go about doing that? Well, there are a number of ways to proceed. Uh, uh, one obvious way is to try to find more or less paired examples. Uh, history doesn't offer true controlled experiments, but it often comes pretty close. Uh, so one can find uh, uh, atrocities or abuses of one sort that on the one hand are committed by official enemies and on the other hand are committed by 
uh, friends and allies or by the favored state itself, by the United States in the U.S. case. And the question is whether the media accept the government framework or whether they use the same agenda, the same set of questions, the same criteria for uh, dealing with the two cases as any honest outside observer would do. If you think America's involvement in the war in Southeast Asia is over, think again. The Khmer Rouge are the most genocidal people on the face of the earth. Peter Jennings reporting from the Killing Fields, Thursday. I mean, the great act of genocide in the modern period is Pol Pot, uh, 1975 to through 1978, that atrocity, I think it would be hard to find any example of a comparable outrage and outpouring of fury and so on and so forth. So that's one atrocity. Well, it just happens that in that case, history did set up a controlled experiment. Hello, I'm Louise Penny, and this is Radio Noon. If you've been listening to the program fairly regularly over the last few months, you'll know East Timor has come into the conversation more than once particularly when we were talking about foreign aid and also the war and a new world order. People wondered why, if the UN was serious about a new world order, no one was doing anything to help East Timor. The area was invaded by Indonesia in 1975. There are reports of atrocities against the Timorese people. And yet Canada and other nations have consistently voted against UN resolutions to end the occupation. Today, we're going to take a closer look at East Timor, what's happened to it, and why the international community is doing nothing to help. One of the people who have been most active is Elaine Bruyere, a photojournalist from British Columbia. She's the founder of the East Timor Alert Network, and she joins me in studio now. Hello. Hi. One uh, tragedy compounding a tragedy is that a lot of people don't know much about East Timor. Where is it? East Timor is just north of Australia, about 420 kilometers, and it's right between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Just south of East Timor is a deep water sea lane, perfect for U.S. submarines to pass through. There's also huge oil reserves there. One of the unique things about East Timor is that it's truly one of the last surviving ancient civilizations in that part of the world. The Timorese spoke 30 different languages and dialects amongst a group of 700,000 people. Today, less than 5% of the world's people live like the East Timorese, basically self-reliant. They live really outside of the global economic system. Small societies like the East Timorese are much more democratic and much more egalitarian, and there's much more sharing of power and wealth. A year after I left East Timor, I was appalled when I heard that Indonesia had invaded. They didn't want a small, independent country setting an example for the region. East Timor was a Portuguese colony. Indonesia had no claim to it and, in fact, stated that they had no claim to it. During the period of colonization, uh, there was a good deal of politicization that different groups developed. A civil war broke out in August 75. It uh, ended up in a victory for Fredlin, uh, which was one of the groupings. Indonesia at once started intervening. What's the situation? When did those ships come in? Uh, they started arriving since Monday. Six, seven boats together, very close to our border. No, they're not there just for fun, you know. Uh, they're preparing a massive operation. Something happened here last night that moved us very deeply. It was so far outside our experience as Australians that we'll find it very difficult to convey to you, but we'll try. Sitting on woven mats under a thatched roof in a hut with no walls, we were the target of a barrage of questioning from men who know they may die tomorrow and cannot understand why the rest of the world does not care. That's all they want, for the United Nations to care about what is happening here. The emotion here last night was so strong that we, all three of us, felt we should be able to reach out into the warm night air and touch it. Greg Shackleton at an unnamed village 
which we'll remember forever in Portuguese Timor. Ford and Kissinger visited Jakarta, I think it was December 5th. We know that they had requested that Indonesia delay the invasion until after they left because it would be too embarrassing. And within hours, I think, after they left, the invasion took place on December 7th. What happened on December 7th in 1975 is just one of the great, um, great evil deeds of history. Early in the morning, bombs began dropping on Dili. The number of troops that invaded Dili that day almost outnumbered the entire population of the town. And for two or three weeks, there was just, they just killed people. By 1978, it was approaching really genocidal levels. The church and other sources estimated about 200,000 people killed. Uh, the U.S. backed it all the way. The U.S. provided 90% of the arms. Uh, right after the invasion, arms shipments were stepped up. When the uh, Indonesians actually began to run out of arms in 1978, the Carter administration moved in and increased arms sales. And other Western countries did the same, Canada, England, Holland, and everybody who could make a buck was in there trying to make sure they could kill more Timorese. There is no Western concern for issues of aggression, atrocities, human rights abuses, and so on, if there's a profit to be made from them. Uh, nothing could show more, it more clearly than this case. By late 1977-78, Indonesia set up receiving centers for those Timorese who came out of the jungle waving white flags. Those the Indonesians thought were more educated or who were suspected of belonging to Fredeline or other opposition parties were immediately killed. They took women aside and flew them off to Dili in helicopters for use by the Indonesian soldiers. They killed children and babies. But in those days, their main strategy and their main weapon was starvation. 